Now in its 10th year, this is GabNet. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey, everybody, live from Harlem in New York City, it's me, I'm Alex, and this is The Ramble. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Mike Chisholm. Mike Chisholm is in Canada. We'll forgive him for that. You know Canada, it's north, it's kind of the, uh, uh, this, the, uh, it's the, uh, uh, what we call a parody version of the United States. <laughs> Uh, and I know how you like parody. Uh, oh, right. parody is the best. It's Mike runs a thing the called the Letterman Podcast. Yeah. And we were talking about uh, last time about all the uh, various people that held down the late shows. And mm-hmm. when you start saying me, saying to me, you start getting into a, you know, uh, you start forgetting some of them. Absolutely, Especially and it all tour. started with Dave. Dave it's, started that opening. Yeah, well, yeah. Prior to that, it was like The Tonight Show and then Dave, okay? Yep. And before that, of course, Tom Snyder with yeah. the... With, uh, and and um, that was it. And, and then Cabot all of a sudden... Bishop and Arsenio, they kind of came along as counter-programming, oh, we didn't but mention, nothing... We didn't mention Arsenio. What did, yeah. you, what did you think of Arsenio? Uh, at the time, I loved him. I, I, I loved him and Dave. Like, it's funny because I loved uh, my favorite time in late night was uh, Letterman, Ferguson, O'Brien at TBS. My second favorite time was Letterman and Arsenio. I used to watch late night with David Letterman and Arsenio Hall pretty much religiously. My question is why Arsenio, who was successful mm-hmm. at what he was doing, very successful, absolutely, uh, quit. I never understood that. Why well, he quit after about three years. Yeah, but it was it was a numbers thing for sure, and a big part of it was to do with Carson stepping down and Letterman moving over to CBS. A big part of it was 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 everything was expanding, and in my opinion, Arsenio's show, while it was amazing, I loved it. Um, I think it was if there was a show that was a, a fad in 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 the late night world, I think mm-hmm. Arsenio Hall is the top of that list. I, I, kind I of think, a fad, um, yeah, kind absolutely. Of uh, now I still loved it. He had on artists and 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 different people that that um, Carson and Letterman uh, wouldn't have on. I think that started to change as well. I think I think I think people started adapting the booking of the main shows, if you want to call them that, yeah, uh, a little bit more. And I think it squeezed Arsenio out, just like it. You know, Chevy Chase tried to start. Um, you know, Joan Rivers you know, tried to start thinking, a show. Just, they get squeezed out. I was just thinking that that. Uh, uh, Arsenio had my good friend Gilbert Gottfried on mm. several occasions. Mm-hmm. Carson never had him on, and I don't think Dave ever had him on. I think in the early days he did. He had him do a lot of st- uh, stand-up. I may be wrong. Do you do want you me know? to find out right now and we can continue the conversation? Yeah, yeah, go find it. Uh, well, how do well you, how- I, I can't find out, but he just messaged me. Uh, hey, buddy, I'm on with Alex Bennett right now. Yeah. We're trying to figure out if Gilbert Gottfried was ever on Letterman, and if so, how many times? And, well, when? Okay. Uh, who, who? Don Giller. Oh, okay, Don so the Giller. master, the man, the myth, the legend, Don Giller, is now part of our conversation, and I love that very, very much. Well, you know, and you can also tell talking. Don if he's not doing anything just to call right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, if you want to open the Zoom link, feel free. We're recording a ramble right now. Yeah, Alex just told me to tell you that. <laughs> which means, of course, he won't do it. Uh, he'll do it. So no, great. he'll call, but at the last minute. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, Gilbert. Uh, yeah, he was uh, he was an amazing talent, and Arsenio had him on a couple of times, I believe. Yeah, but Carson never had him on, and I don't think on the uh, at least at CBS, neither did Letterman. Yeah. And I think um, maybe part of the problem was is that Gilbert was just too rich a mixture. You know, they they kind of felt they couldn't control him. Which to me makes a great guest. Oh, Letterman. Oh, oh Don just sent me uh, a collection 
Gilbert Godfrey. Okay, so Don Giller actually has. Oh man, now I'm embarrassed because I know Don Giller's channel pretty well. He's got a Don. He's got a Gilbert Godfrey collection on Letterman uh, and Late Show jokes. So it's both. And uh, how long is this thing? Oh, and it's an hour long. So there's a lot of Godfrey on Letterman. It's an hour okay. long. But it's ask him if it channel. was ask him if it was only the the uh, NBC show or was it did he appear on the CBS show? He appeared on the CBS show by jokes. Okay, Don says tell him I'll pop in at the last minute. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, buddy. We're almost there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah he it says uh, uh uh it says the collection the, the title of it does say plus late show jokes 2012 2013 so obviously there was something in 2012 2013 that he did with late show and uh i'm gonna dive into that late so show there we go late show jokes though that i don't yeah, understand you might have to send some stuff in i don't know that's yeah. uh I'm going to watch that collection. But I always figured out. anybody that have have Gilbert Gottfried on was brave. Yeah. Because what would happen is Gilbert would hijack the show. Yes. And, but Like a you, Robin Williams type thing, except yeah, completely different. But you have to know how to handle him. And if you yes. know how to handle him, it's bliss. Yeah. Okay. How would you handle him when he would come on your show? How would I handle him? I just let him go. Yeah. I just let him go. You know, my f theory always, I'll tell you, I told you I didn't like Steve Allen. Yeah. But I got to tell you, I got a couple of pieces of advice from him. And one of the pieces of advice was never try to top the guest because he's there to work for you. Mm -hmm. And the other is always try to be fun, not funny, because you can be fun all the time, but you can't be funny all the time. I thought Those that was pretty timeless pieces of advice. Those are timeless. Like that's a yeah. long time ago that he would have given you that advice. Yeah, exactly. And it still pertains to today. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was a great. Yeah. I, he didn't give it to me personally. I heard him in an interview say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, still, I did. In, I did interview Steve. And uh, by the way, speaking of people who hijack the show. Yes. You know, <laughs> I mean, he would tell you where to put the microphone. Yep. And you go, aren't you here in my world, you know? What are you trying to do? Hijack it and make it yours, you know? <laughs> so that, I, I, that, I, I was never fond of Steve Allen. Yeah. Uh, how about, no. how about Co uh, uh, Corden? See, again, I think Corden, he, I, the last person that I've kind of attached to was, was, was Craig Ferguson. I haven't attached to anybody out there I, i'll watch them um and i had already attached to kimmel i enjoy kimmel a lot and and, and kimmel, I knew Colbert oh we point, forgot but, kimmel you forgot oh yeah kimmel. no no there, we, there's a bunch that we haven't talked I about think yet kimmel, that we could go to. kimmel is terrific but i think it's because he learned everything he learned from dave yes it's a dave tribute show yeah it's a dave tribute show exactly Which i'm okay with i'm fine well with that. i mean he learned the lessons and he plays the game right you know yes and he's ABC. ABC is Disney. And so he's a perfect vehicle because he he and I have many, many of the same interests of the thing in Marvel movies and Star Wars and all that sort of stuff. And so he's a perfect vehicle for promotion for uh, for that uh, Disney machine. He's he's he, but he has that Dave sensibility in many respects. He's edgy. When I was in L.A. a couple uh, a couple months ago to see Dave, um, Dave's former booker also books for. Uh, for for Kimmel, and so she got me in the VIP treatment, the whole nine yards, and I got to sit there and I got to watch and deconstruct uh, this show. The, J Jimmy came out and he talked about mushrooms, and he and Chris Pine had this uh, edgy conversation about like I I think that Kimmel has edge to him more than than the other hosts. Um, in a, it, it just in a, a different kind of edge, I should say, and I think he gets all of that from Dave. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Uh, I like Kimmel a lot. Uh, no question about it. Uh, Gordon was good. He was good for the for the modern new audience. Lots of uh, YouTubeable, viral, uh, internet uh, friendly type moments and segments and things like that that he had. Um, I can see why he was so popular. I can also see why he didn't last. Um, you know, who again? Um, uh, Gordon, Jimmy. Uh, well, James Cor Gordon. well, Gordon it lasted as long as he wanted to. He yeah. decided to get out. You know, I, when Corden took that job, I was always a fan of Corden prior to that show, and he was okay on that show. 
yep. but not great. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, Corden was so successful as an actor, as a writer, as a, you know, in a lot of different areas as a performer that he didn't need to be tied down like that. And I think he yeah. just wanted to do it for a couple of years so he could experience America and then go home. And that's exactly what he did, you know. Mm -hmm. So he had his heart in the show, but not the country or the circumstance. That's a great way of putting it. You I know. couldn't agree more. Couldn't so, agree more. So that was his problem. Did uh, you like Kilborn? I know he wasn't on that long. Did you watch him very much? Did you? Kilborn was okay. Yeah. Again, not one of my favorites, you know. Uh, it was good that he went into other things like movies and crap like that, you know. But, yep. Um, I'm thinking. And then we got then we got Fallon, which Fallon, we haven't talked about yet. Fallon. Yeah. Uh, 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 do we have to talk about Fallon? Nope, we sure don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's terrible. I think he's yeah. just ghastly. But you can't deny how talented he is, though, right? Like, you may not well, like the talent, you know, so but a his guy, talent for so, impressions yeah, and things so, like so that. So a like, guy can juggle. So a guy <laughs> can tap dance. So a guy can walk a tightrope. If you don't do them all the best of anybody, I don't really give a good goddamn. Okay, you know? so something that you said earlier, let's go and do a callback to something you said earlier with the advice from Steve Allen. If you watch... Uh, uh, J uh, Jimmy Fallon on Late Show with David Letterman, and it was during the time before he took over the Tonight Show. It was it was when he was hosting Late Night. Yeah, and J Jimmy Fallon comes on as a guest. He gets two segments, and David Letterman made him look like a billion dollars. He did a uh, he told a story about Caitlyn Jenner, and in it, it's a funny story. Okay, and this is before Caitlyn Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner. It was still they they were still Bruce Jenner at the time. Mm -hmm. He tells a story about the Olympics and Bruce Jenner, and he does a Tom Brokaw impression, and the story is funny. And then he gets his guitar out in another segment, and he does the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme as Neil Young. And Dave made him look like a million dollars. He made him look wonderful and this, talented this is and Fallon. everything. And this it's is exactly, Fallon. that's Fallon yeah. uh, in panel on Dave's in Dave's in Late Show. And it's it proving your point and Steve Allen's point exactly where 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 you you elevate the guest and you do that, and and you watch that interview and you're like you know what I'd watch that guy's show that's how good he was in being interviewed by Dave. I think he does a terrible show. I think he watch does that not... segment. Watch that segment though. I He's say. done and, that and... thing for ten years and he still doesn't know how to do it. <laughs> you know. Well, you talk about a guy during an interview where. You're, you're. I mean, you, you, you say maybe. Mr. Okay, Cabot okay. Here's the, here's boy, the thing. Here's the thing. He sucks up to his guests and laughs at their guests, like, 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 you know. If uh, tomorrow anyway. you get a late show on one of the networks. Yes. Okay. Yes. You should watch Letterman. Yep. And you should watch Jack Parr. Absolutely. And that's about it. That's yep. all you need to know. That's the only school you ha the place you have to go to school is the yep. school of Letterman and the school of Parr. Yep. Those two people more. knew how to do that kind of show. Yep. They knew how to do a show with people who were watching you between their toes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who knew how to do a show late at night and entertain <laughs> people and give them a, a, a coda for their day. I've never heard watching between your toes before. That's fantastic. No, I don't think I made it up. I think I don't think you did either, but it's those, fantastic either I way. I think Parr made it up. I said most people watch me between their toes. <laughs> you know. Uh, but it's true, you know. Uh, and I can never figure out quite a bit that, you know, how how people don't go to those references to see how to run a show. I don't know where Fallon went. He certainly didn't look at Dave, and he didn't look at Parr, and he didn't even look at Steve Allen or anybody else. Yeah. You know. The pa he, their past, I mean, where they came from, I think, has a huge impact on the type of show that they that they have. One of the reasons why Kimmel, I think, is such a close connection to Dave isn't just because of the reverence, but they both came from broadcasting. They both came from bro their broadcasters first. You know, Leno was a, t a comedian first. Jimmy Fallon was an SNL sketch Well, actually, performer. actually, Dave was it was in television 
as a weatherman, and that was about it. Well, radio, no, 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 no. Like, like, um, this is where I'll plug Zinneman's, Jason Zinneman's book, The Last China Late Night. He did a phenomenal job, meticulous job, going back into Dave's college radio days. Oh, and college radio. About, I didn't know he did oh, that. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, again, I, I, I highly recommend this book to you specifically, those first few chapters, Alex, because I think you'll find a kindred spirit there. Um, you know, push boundaries and 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 got fired because of breaking format and doing some of these things where, uh, you know, again, um, uh, pushing the envelope of, 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 of a little bit of, uh, of, of mischief. And, and he did that in his college days. These were the things that 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 built um, that attitude that went into his television careers. Yeah, but what's the difference like between that? radio and television? A more expensive receiver, I think. There you go. Yes. Yes. I mean, but and, the fact is that, that uh, um, you know, it, 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 the fact is that people should understand that you're there to entertain people. Yep. That's it. And when you talk uh, uh, out there, you're talking not to on thousands of people. You're talking to one person. There's only, when I'm doing a radio show, there's only one person listening to it. You know, and that's the person that. whose ears it's going through. Yeah. And so you don't act like they're a whole crowd, but you talk to that one person. And that, I'll tell you, that's one thing it, it, Snyder did so mm -hmm. well. He could sit in that chair and he could look directly into that camera and he was looking at you. He yes. wasn't looking at anybody else. Now, let me, let me ask you this. What was the main success of Carson? What was the thing that he did that showed that what he what he was trying to do? Are you talking about like a segment of the you show? Probably, you, you probably don't. Monologue, I, I, are you maybe, talking about maybe, maybe I'm asking the question. Not all the monologue. Wrong. I'll like, I'll that's you, the first I'll thing I think of when I think of Carson. I'll tell you what it was. If you watch okay. the monologue, yeah, Carson never looked directly at the camera. No, that's right. He had them look side again. to side. <laughs> Side he, to side. Because, side because he side. had all of his cue cards lined up in a row. Yeah, but, but also because he never looked directly at the camera. That was not yeah. his style of doing nope. things. He never nope. looked directly in the camera. Nope. That's why his goodbye speech was so powerful. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, uh, Snyder looked directly into that camera. Could not agree he more. He was talking to me. Yep. You know? Uh, you know, these are all things that we talk about, and there, in my case, it's a professional looking at other professionals. Yeah. Well, and when I look at those other professionals, it. I realize how bad I am, you know. <laughs> well, hold on. Okay, so what you just said there, though, tripped something in my head because it's like, okay, you've now, uh, you know, when, when, when you were let go from, uh, was it w, WMCA? No. I but, where it was. Well, it I was, was let go from a lot of places. But so. but when you were let go and there was the protest the next oh, day, oh, like, uh, WMCA, yeah, MCA. Okay, Letterman, same, same. Here, you know, Stern, even the same thing. Like, if you, the idea that you are broadcasting to one person, that is what the thing about Letterman that I loved was. I felt like I was part of a secret club. I felt like I would go to high school or I'd go to junior high and having watched the night before. And two or three people, we would look at each other as we walked by each other, like knowing glances, Se like, okay, club. like we yeah. felt like we were part yeah. of something. You created that. It's the reason why on Monday, so many people who listen to you for years want to come on that, that, that show you do, uh, that panel show you do, because you and Dave have that in common, whereas the listener or the viewer, whatever it is, feels included in what's happening. And I think that you just uh, really, really... Um, Loosened a keystone for me. Uh, thank you for saying that. That's really, really cool that you you made that. Yeah, but a lot of times, a lot of those people are amazed that they're even on a show with me, you know, wow. because they spent their whole time listening to that show. Yep. You know, but basically the people who are on the show from California and New York know who I am. The well, other people don't. I mean, that. Well, I look at Mandy's in Atlanta, Georgia. She knows who you are. No, she heard she, you on Sirius. She heard me on Sirius. Yeah, yeah. I had yeah. a wider. Well, you see, by that time, see, radio was a local thing. Yes. You know, you go outside yes. the city limits of San Francisco, and nobody knew who the hell I was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that was the nature of radio, also local television. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in the case of Sirius XM, I was suddenly going out to an entire country. Yep. You know, so there are people around the country who remember me from Sirius XM, but they don't know me from Live 105 in San Francisco. Right. Which is probably the best work I ever did. Yeah. You know, uh, the work I did in, in New York, I, I was the youth guru, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and that was a that was a successful show, but the one in San Francisco, by and large, was the most successful thing I ever did. Well, I think it's again comparing it to Letterman. Like you think about late night and him as uh, like okay, fair enough. You saying that and that makes sense to me, especially with the comedic uh, elements that you added, you know, the audience and all of that stuff, all the comedians. Okay, but you think back to New York originally, and it's like okay, well, John Lennon and Abby Hoffman and big stuff, like really. Big important oh, I, stuff I, That was an too. interesting time for me, but it was a completely different time than hanging out yes. with all the comedians in San Francisco. And yeah, well, I, I mean, did the I, same I'll thing. By the way, one, which did, is more fun? I, than I, comedians. I, oddly enough, I did the same thing in San Francisco. I did in New York. The only difference was the cast was different. Right. You know. Okay. I, I yep. specialized in comics in San Francisco. That was yes. quite by accident, but it worked. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I became the first morning show to have a live studio audience. Yeah. You know, and the first morning show to, to interview comics as a, as a regular staple of the show. In New York, I did musicians and left-wing radicals like Abby Hoffman and whatever. But then I would also, I remember I was watching a video the other day of this person. One of the first, I think the first musician I ever had on on my radio show in New York that made me say, hey, I should do more musical people, which was hard to get in those days because you'd call up these record companies and you'd say, I'd like one of your rock people to come on my show. They'd say, you want to talk to a rock musician? Yeah. You know, and I said, absolutely. Yep. But I think the first one was Melanie. You don't even remember Melanie, do you? I don't. Nope, I don't. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, she, uh, 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 what, what was it? What were the songs? A brand new pair of roller skates. I've got a brand new pair of roller skates. Yeah, I just heard a girl sing that in karaoke last night. Yeah, a twenty-two-year-old girl sang that song last uh, night in yeah, karaoke. Yeah, talk uh, about iconic. <laughs> uh, and uh, look what they've done to my song, Ma. Oh, that, okay. There you go. Which That's Miley okay. Cyrus does on YouTube. Yep. Yeah. yeah, great song. Uh, sure. but, uh, but it was Melanie. She's your first. She was your first. I think she was my first. I can't remember oh, any no other. No kidding. No kidding. You know, I mean, I remember my first uh, author was an, a guy who'd become a friend uh, because I used to have mom by phone from another at another station. I think I'm in Minneapolis was Michael O'Donoghue. Wow. You know, so yeah. Michael was a very close friend of mine. Um. I used to have all the National Lampoon people on my show doing parodies and stuff like that, you know. One night we, I, I won't go into it, but basically one night we made people believe that there were concentration camps in America and we had the people on who ran them. And the, the people at the Lampoon said to me, before we do this, remember, what you do is you do something with the assumption going into it that it already exists... Right. What you're now questioning is, are they being run properly? <laughs> so that you remove it one step away from being fake. Yep. Okay? And we had people calling the radio station, turning <laughs> in their, uh, their brothers and sisters and sons <laughs> and daughters. Oh, that's awesome. And I had Doug oh, Kenny where's on. Where's the tape I, of that? Does that exist? I, oh, my I, I God. I don't have it anymore. Doug Kenny oh. played a retard a kind of, uh, who's been brain, uh, brainwashed and uh, given the front, prefrontal lobotomies. And it was, uh, you know, and Michael O'Donoghue was on it. And, uh, um, wow. you know, it was, it was a great show. I don't know. I don't have a copy of it. Anybody have a copy out there? Send it to me. I was gonna say this. To you. I was gonna say this on a few Mondays ago on the show, and it, it, it the moment came up, and then it went. Uh, your live 105 stuff. How good of a podcast would that be now? Just playing the old clips of you with the old comedians with the audience there. That would be. I would take. I would listen to that podcast. I'd subscribe to it. I'd listen to every episode that came out. And and it's just all this gold that you guys. Spun. I have a lot of that stuff on my uh, Roku channel. 
Is there? Uh, do you really? I have a Gab Nemroku channel. Yeah, and there's a lot of audio of comedians uh, like uh, Dave Chappelle uh, oh, see, doing gotta, their act gotta, and so on. I don't have any Roku stuff up here. I gotta, I gotta figure that out. If that's the case, I gotta go find that stuff. I, I that's gold to me. Do you have a Roku? I don't, but I, I'll uh, get it. Buy a Roku, I'll, I'll put a Gab, yeah. uh, look up GabNet and watch it. There you know, we go. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. You know. But listen, we've run out of time again. Thanks, Alex. It just goes this by is, this so This is a treat fast. for me. Anytime huh? you need me, anytime you need a guest, uh, I'll be your Tony Hey, Randall, you don't have friend. to kiss my ass. I want I'm you not. back. I want you back. <laughs> anytime, sir. And look, Giller, Giller didn't call. No, he didn't. He didn't, didn't call. He didn't. I got a couple of messages from him here, but yeah, no, he didn't. Ladies call. and gentlemen, that is the uh, ever popular Mike Chisholm. He <laughs> is the host of a show called the Letterman Podcast. Go listen to it. I'll talk to you later. Peace and love. Bye bye. Now in its tenth year, this is Gabnet. Talk like you've never heard it before. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, let me, let me, let me do what I got to do here so that I can uh, hear better. Okay, there we go. Hello, everybody. How are you? Uh, another good evening, and thanks to, uh, I'm a, I want Mike Chisholm on more. I enjoy him. He's, uh, he really knows his stuff, and uh, uh, I know my stuff, too. So we, we both get along. Anyway. You know, we were talking about uh, we were talking about um, um, the, these late night shows and what late night shows were good and what late night shows were bad. And uh, uh, earlier today, I was watching some some of them. Okay, Colbert, yeah, um, um, uh, Seth Meyers, yeah, and but the thing they they all do and they all try to do are impressions of Donald Trump. And uh, thank God, you know, I have to hand it to um, um, uh, J Jimmy uh, Kimmel, who does more material about Trump than anybody, okay, practically. He never does an impression of Donald Trump, but all these other numb nuts try to. Colbert tries to do it. He's terrible at doing Trump. Uh, Seth Meyers does him. I have to turn Seth Meyers off the minute he starts going into his Trump impression. These impressions are so mediocre, I can't begin to tell you, you know? So anyway, I just, uh, I just wanted to say that in following what we have been saying here uh, all along. And... Uh, uh, you know, tonight with our discussion about those late shows, he's one of them. You know that uh, the the Colbert is terrible, and and uh, and Seth Meyers is terrible with his impression. That I never have heard of Fallon does an impression. I think he does, and it's not very good either, from what I remember. But anyway, so uh, that's that's my comment to to go along with what we were discussing tonight. And in fact, I will discuss it with him the next time I, uh, I talk to him. But let me bring some of these people in. There are only about three people waiting right now, but I will admit them all. And um, let me see here. There they are. Uh, there's a... Uh, hey, uh, look at yourself, Brian. You're... Look at myself? Yeah. Turn, How can I look at myself? Turn I need your, a mirror. Turn your phone or whatever sideways. There, there, no, it, go, go, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, because of that, it didn't, for some reason, if you turn sideways, it doesn't turn sideways as well. I think you have your phone locked is what you have. It, or, what are you using, an iPad or a phone? A phone. A phone. <laughs> so that's what the phone did. And I have no idea. Oh, there we go. There's Josh. Because yeah, my Wi-Fi is always slow at the beginning, so I just... Screw it! I use my phone for a little while. Yeah, well, you know, it, the problem you got you got is that you're you're uh, you know you're in that uh, portrait mode, and Jeff Stein just disappeared. Okay. Oh, well. Huh? You did. You yeah, just I do. turned off well, tur turned off your camera. He's just a gray block. You turned off your camera. You got to turn your camera back on. 
What button does he push, guys? I don't have my iPhone here. so The left one. The one on the left. The one on the left? The one that has a camera. Right? Um. Jeff, you can't find it. Jeff, are you still there? Yeah. Hey, Pammy. <laughs> oh, I need boy. your help. If you move yeah. the mouse around, it should bring up the lower the lower bar of the screen, and it's not all the way to the left. It's a second from the left of mine. It says video. Yeah. 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 There's an arrow. You can hit on it and probably. Well, let's see here. Well, of course, it's right next to the one that says audio. Yes. And, and I think, yeah, there, there you go. Uh, thank you, Pammy. Thanks, you're Pam. Welcome. You're Thanks, his, you're, Pammy. You're, you're his service animal. I just help out where I can. <laughs> That's all. All right. You got to so. cross her. Your gapnet check is in the mail. Yeah. There you go. That's right. Have fun, guys. Okay, thanks. Appreciate yeah. it, Pam. Appreciate Anytime. it. Uh, what? No, don't don't touch anything, Jeff. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, don't it's touch fine. Anything. Don't touch anything. You know. Hello there to Josh. A good evening to you once again, Josh. Hello. Uh, hi. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? I'm doing okay. You know. Uh, but um, uh, am I right? Do you watch any of those late night shows at all, Josh? I really don't. Yeah. Um, I mean, I not much for comedy or comedians, as we've talked a little bit about before. I mean, I liked Letterman okay. I never really cared for Leno. Um, there was a book I read when I was in, like, middle school called the late shift yeah, that i think yeah, it's, hbo it's made a, into a movie it's a great book it's a great and i read book. it you know and, and and you know it was just about like you know like letterman off air for a long time sadly was a super depressed guy yeah you know you know when he wasn't doing a show and you know and leno's extra little eccentric at time you know so yeah. it was just about the business so i know a little bit but i'm not really yeah and uh like comedians or uh comedy shows uh, stand up that kind of a lot of people are i mean well that was my business quite a while ago yeah you know i so. like nikki glazer but not for the reasons Nick, everyone might think <laughs> uh, uh, oh nikki let's talk about nikki glazer for a second <laughs> what is it about her you like i like that she's blonde <laughs> and about 120 pounds but. You like her for all the sexist reasons, right? <laughs> well, which, if you watch her shows, apparently that's pretty much what she talks about from the second she comes on the stage till she leaves. And so. then she also wears outfits, which are extremely uh, well. Uh, they're not, ex yeah, right. So no, but yeah, I yeah. think I have that's to, weird I have to comedy, admit. But, I have to yeah. admit, how many here? Anybody here seen Nikki Glaser between uh, he and I? Would you agree she is really funny? Yeah, no, she's she's actually really funny. Yeah, I, I listen to a lot of uh, on the on Sirius. They have a lot of the um, comedy channels, and so I'll bounce around there. And if she's one, when I see her name on there, I'll listen. Yeah, I, I uh, uh, when I first saw her, I went, "Wow, this is she's good." Yeah, you know, uh, and and I can't I can't remember why I felt she was so good. She was just doing something none of the others are doing. Right. I, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I've seen a bit, you know, I think, I don't know, a month or so ago, I turned my TV on and it was on HBO but when I turned it off and it was on one of her specials was on when I turned it on and I saw, I caught like the last 10 minutes or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I think they filmed a few of her or, you know, the, the main act that she's doing everywhere she goes and all that kind of stuff. But so I've, I've seen, you know, what it was about, but. She I started think, out doing podcasts, I believe. You know, I'm not really sure. I mean, I know apparently she did that that deal that Netflix did with Tom Brady or whatever, and mm -hmm. there were a lot of people that, that were mm -hmm. surprised about some of the jokes. And and I'm like, well, you know, if you've seen her comedy shows, what did you expect? That's where <laughs> that's where I first saw her, I believe, and then we went and watched her specials, and we thought yeah. they were absolutely terrific. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. she's filthy. She's absolutely oh, yeah, filthy. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. But there's yeah. nothing dirty about her. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, but, you... Yeah, I've, I've seen her stuff, but, I mean, 
I don't really do a lot of, you know, I don't watch the late shows or, you know, anything like that. I really just, I just really never did a little bit with Letterman here and there. Yeah. When I was younger and I would stay up till three o'clock in the morning and stuff like that. But Brian, <clears throat> Brian, Nikki Glazer. Oh yeah. No, I, yeah, I like her, but, but I, I don't know what you guys were talking about earlier, maybe, uh, but the night shows. Yeah. I used to on VHS, I used to record, uh, uh, Johnny Carson and Letterman, and I used to watch them the next morning. I, I really liked them. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I got to tell you, the only one of the late night guys who really, like Colbert thinks he's so great at political comedy, and he's really not. He's really quite mediocre. Uh, and and Seth Meyers sets himself up as being somebody who does comedy about about the news of the day and so on, and he's really mediocre. But I do feel that Jimmy Kimmel is the real deal, you know? He is genuinely funny, and he he has a way of going after politics in a way that none of the others have. They're just a little too obvious about it, and he just does it, you know? And I think he's very good. Have you watched Kimmel at all? Uh, no, I guess not. Okay. Well, I've, seen, I've seen his... I mean, I know who he is, and I've seen it, but... If people I'm, haven't watched Jimmy Kimmel, they're missing out on something, you know? Um He's the close. If you like Letterman, he's the closest thing to Letterman we've got now, really? you know. And it was only because as he was growing up, Letterman was his idol, <laughs> you know. And uh, he took it. Uh, he took it seriously. Oh, here comes Bree. Bree is about to join us. He is in Malaysia. Uh, let me see here. Is he? Is he there? Or is this somebody going to pretend to be him? I don't know. We will hope that he does it right. Let me just turn myself on here, just to just in case it is him. Um, Bree, are you there? No, I'm there. Just give it a minute; it will uh, catch up. Oh, okay. Sorry. That is that is him. Okay, so we don't have to worry Some about minute. it. Just give me a minute. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. Um, Otherwise, uh, you know, I mean, I was uh, I, I look at the news and so on, and, you know, I get more irritated by the news every day that I watch it. Oh. I just, you know, I, I, I said to Marjorie today, I said, the last half hour on MSNBC, all they've been talking about is Donald Trump and this thing in uh, Springfield, <laughs> right, with the cats and dogs. Yeah. And I went... Isn't it time to get on to something else? You know, haven't we beaten this in, in, into the ground like a dead horse, for crying out loud? Yeah, very much. You know, I'm so tired of seeing that one clip. Of course, I know he said that, and she reacted wonderfully uh, to it with just mm -hmm. her, her looks and so on. But how many times do we have to see that clip, and how many times do we have to discuss it? And, and aren't they, by discussing it, playing into Trump's game plan? Because it's just like it was back in 2016, over and over and over with the Trump stuff until why is he, he doesn't have to buy time on MSNBC. They give him all the free time he needs, you know. I mean, they haven't tired of him, but apparently Fox has because the other day he was in the middle of some kind of speech he was giving and they turned them off. They just <laughs> went to something else. Uh -huh. uh, it seems as though Fox is starting to now not run his speeches any longer. Uh -huh. You know? Uh, and, and so, I mean, if Fox gives up on you and you're a right winger, you know you're in trouble. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, what looks, you know what it looks like with Bree today? He's all dressed up wearing a tie and everything. And then we see the ceiling there, which kind of looks industrial. And, and and when you look at him, he looks like he's the manager of a McDonald's. <laughs> In drive through Yeah, doesn't he? He said the drive through Yeah, there's, there's a Bree and his, uh, uh, you know, he's he's the the uh, general manager of McDonald's. Oh, there but he made him mad. What? He just disappeared. Goodbye. Oh, well, anyway. 
Uh, let me see here. So yeah, but I mean, is that is that how it's gonna be at what 50, 50 days or something like that? It's, I mean, it just but still, I mean, these guys haven't learned that you know he's kind of like Beetlejuice. Juice. You mention his name three times and he appears, right? If you don't mention him, he doesn't appear. You know, mm-hmm. and if you want to win and you want your person to win, play all her her speeches. To get on and say what she's doing that's so great and wonderful. You know. And don't spend 30 minutes of your hour, of your precious hour, talking about Trump. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't realize they got him elected in 2016 because they couldn't shut up about him. He knows how to monopolize the, the press. He knows how to monopolize the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the he, 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 somebody said he, you know, he sucks the oxygen out of the room. You know, and they're allowing themselves to go along with it again. And even when when it's absurd press, you know, they say, you know, uh, you know, any press is good press. But the absurdity of the things that he says, and then it still just rattles on for days and days and days. Yeah. Now, by the way, Trump hates um, um, my uh, what's her name, uh, uh, the singer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. How can I not remember that name? He hates Taylor Swift. He put up a thing. I hate Taylor Swift. There's never been a president in history who has ever said in any forum or anything, I hate so and so. You know, I disagree with so and so. I dislike so and so, but not mm-hmm. I hate them. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, can- I mean, that's not something that I think we should want. I mean, I don't, I think. You know, people can make their argument. Yeah, you presidents are humans, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I get it. I mean, I know we had presidents that hated people, but they didn't, you know, publicize it so that it didn't become a thing because the yeah. government or the people who run the government don't have the right to single people, individuals out, you know, for being who they are, you know, individuals, you know, <clears throat> acting within their or, rights. Or simply, they, simply because they have an opinion. You know? Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, he can hate her. That's fine, but if you take a look at it, I think there are better to, terms than hate that you could use. Has, but you know, but she hasn't done anything wrong, right? I mean, she's just, everything that she's done is well within her rights as an American citizen to do, right? Yeah, right. She uh, uses her freedom of expression to make music and her freedom of speech to mm-hmm. advocate for things that she says that she believes in. As far as we know, she breaks no laws. And she and feels she that she has sure. generously contributed to many local economies for a long time. Yeah, so. and she feels that she has a certain a microphone, yeah. and she's using that microphone in this particular case to make her 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 uh, her thoughts known. Uh, you can either agree or disagree with that, right. but you know, I mean, uh, I've often said, who cares what a personality thinks? I'm not going to. Go vote for somebody because a personality says so. Yeah, and they still they still have Swifties for Trump. There's a group called Swifties for Trump. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That's fun. You know, they're allowed to have their their thing. But you yeah. know, I mean, a little bit of Trump's is, I'm sure, is jealousy. You know, mm-hmm. because in many ways she is a more popular person than he is <laughs> now i mean you know look when she came to cincinnati and did two sold out shows every hotel was sold out every restaurant was busy mm-hmm. and the city was a buzzing with millions of dollars changing hands you know yeah you can't do that and very <laughs> and, and, and very little of those dollars were going into her pocket correct you were going into yeah, she pocket doesn't get the hotel the- money the <laughs> restaurant money that people like me get that you know me or you or you or you the guy that owns the restaurant or the guy that manages the hotel or the Mm-hmm. The, the Uber drivers and the, you know, I mean the, I mean, it's a big weekend for them, right? He's I mean, been very good I bet for if you economy. wanted to drive around Uber, they're all over the place down there. He's so been he, very good for the economy of cities. I'm it's sure terrific. Has. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, she did two. I mean, you know, more people. She did two shows in Cincinnati at the football stadium, and both of them were full. You know, this mm-hmm. big stadium. You know. <laughs> yeah, I was driving home well, from Lodi. Uh, I was driving home from Lodi, and people were driving from Sacramento to to, to uh, Santa Clara, so like two hours to go. 
And then they were saying that the stadium was, you know, sold out. And there were people outside, like tailgaters, you know, like outside yeah. just right. to be That's there and hear the music outside the stadium. Yeah, there were apparently tens of thousands of people that were there that didn't even go to the concert. But the thing is, is, you know, I'm sure that there were people there from Tennessee, Michigan, yeah. Missouri, yeah. Indiana, can I, Pennsylvania. Can, can I for and, a moment yeah. sound like the old guy that I am? I cannot tell you one Taylor Swift song. <laughs> and I used to know everything about music. Okay. But yeah, I yeah. somehow, somewhere, she eluded me. Uh, uh, no. Yeah. It's okay. I but I'm sure, I'm sure there were some gas station owners and restaurant yeah. owners that couldn't either, but they Bree, took Bree, was, Bree's trying to say something here. Yes, Bree. Yeah. Well, uh, they all kind of messed together in my head, you know, and they... It's like bubble gum, you know, you chew it for a while, you listen to it for a while, and then it loses its flavor. Well, I think you, know? you can tell the difference between P. Diddy and Taylor Swift. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. He's the one that pulls um, women down the hallway by their hair. Uh, I think <laughs> he's doing a lot more than that. Yeah. Uh, let's not forget that uh, 2018, Taylor Swift endorsed Phil Bredesen in the Tennessee Senate race, mm. and he lost. Uh, he lost. Yeah, but she so. wasn't as big then as she is now. She has only become oh, this she was. massive. <clears throat> no, she's, she's been big since for at least She's been years. big, but she hasn't been this big. I think it's only been the last couple of years, isn't it, guys, that she's gotten these incredible venues. Beyond. With, yeah. Yeah, Beyonce big. Yeah, the Beyonce last three big. or four years have certainly been, you know, peak. I would say for her, but but you know, she has been very, very famous for mm. you know, at but, least seven or eight years. Oh, and she oh, longer was well than known that. Yeah, for a few years before that. Then she go back to something like I'm thinking well, 2002, maybe. No, well, I'm it's not been sure. Since that's 2006. 20, yeah, but, you know, okay. But I, I know around like 2010, 2011, she was certainly becoming well known when they kind of pushed her out of the country music deal and into what right. She was a country music artist. Yeah, she her was first song was Tim McGraw. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't and, think she was uh, good enough for them, so they moved on. You seem to. 2009, she, she sold 7 million albums. So she was right. pretty big. Seven million? Now what does she sell? <laughs> Seven hundred well, million? Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, they it's all streaming now or whatever. You also have to like remember she's a world a billion streams she, or something. She, she's a worldwide sensation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean I'm she sure Trump doesn't I'm sure Trump doesn't like the fact that he's not, you know. I mean as as respected as she is, you know, I mean, he doesn't like anybody that's more important than he is. <laughs> so, I I mean, want, yeah, I want to take yeah, up something with br right. brief, brief for a second. I got a, uh, a a message yesterday from one of our listeners, right, who was uh, uh, talking about um, the um, about you, Bree. He said, "Okay, does Alex know that Bree is a Trump fan?" or Trump person. <laughs> and uh, I thought for uh, about it for a moment, and I have seen you all over the place, actually. You know? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, well, I, there, there were times when I thought, oh, I guess he thinks Trump is okay. But then again, I feel a lot of what you bring up is you trying to create conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To a large extent, it yeah. is. I, the thing is, is that I, I am, I'm someone who believes you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, you know? So like w w when somebody comes in and says like, I'm all for Kamala Harris, I hate Trump and Trump mm -hmm. is a monster and he's terrible. Then it's hard to have a conversation because, you know, well, then you know, how, you know, how people are, are lying. And I think that attitude has been pervasive throughout American society. Mm -hmm. we, we can't talk to each other anymore. So I, I keep an open ear to, because there are, I mean, if you say, well, there's nothing that Trump ever did that was ever good, uh, then I would disagree. But on balance, he had 90% back. But he's, there are some elements 
where, you know, he didn't, to my knowledge, he didn't start any wars. He wasn't a big warmonger. Like, he didn't like to do war stuff. Um, mm. You know, he also, the other thing is. Well, also, he didn't uh, like the military much. And he, you know, I think, I think he, he got out of the military for bone spurs. So I think his whole feeling about it is kind of, shall we say, yeah. tempered. I think uh, on the economy and on immigration, he wins because, you know, he has that uh, that attitude of we're going to deport people and close the wall and, you know, do this and that. And on the economy, he basically will say anything that makes money or helps the economy, we're going to do it. Like, you know, he, he goes against nature, you know, drill, baby, drill. So some some people in the short term like that, you know, and so. I disagree with that, that the policy on, uh, you know, on uh, drilling and. Well, I don't. Land. I don't think he's. I don't think that he's uh, particularly good on the economy, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, he. I don't think he's good on the economy because this guy has never really run a successful company. They've all gone bankrupt. You know, so what? What's his idea of how you save America and its situation? Well, you're gonna, you're gonna like uh, bankrupt the United States and then burn it down the gr well, down to the ground for the insurance money. Yeah, I, I think that when I think that bankruptcy, I've seen it used. Uh, I I ran a business, and I had another one, one of my, my connections is up there a hundred percent. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. But don't, if you're going to talk, uh, Jeff, then we have to have you mute. Oh, yeah, I didn't know if he was talking there. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so I ran a business, and I there was a larger business that I supplied to, and they, decla they declared bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why they did it was not to go out of business, but they, want, they were in leases in shopping malls that they wanted to get out of. And the only way they could do it was declare bankruptcy and reorganize. So, uh, so they didn't declare bankruptcy because they were failing. They declared bankruptcy to get out of contracts that were they believed were not in their interest right. anymore. Right. So, so I think it's a business tactic sometimes that's used. I don't agree with it. Obviously, I was on the other side of it, mm. and I wouldn't want that to be done. Um, so I don't know. You know, I I just. I'm not voting for him, but at the same time, I, I I don't like the rhetoric when it gets too elevated to the point where we can't even. Well, none of it. us. No, I don't think any of us like the the rhetoric, okay, on either side. But I don't think the Democrats could be considered raising that that uh, that uh, that dialogue to a peak. You know, I think we do to a certain extent. You know, like when I hear MSNBC well, bashing him for 30 minutes on this dog cat thing, which, you know, is already a story that's so old, it's ridiculous, you know? Yeah. I just think that I, I don't want to get to the point where we can't have a discussion about it. And so I'm always trying to, you know, temper that to say, I guess it's, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I always say I'm a moderate, pragmatic centrist. And, you know, it, both in terms of, you know, the different dimensions on which the scales are there. Yeah. You know, I'm neither fully liberal, not fully conservative. I'm not fully populist. I'm not fully corporate. I like to be right in the middle because I think it depends on the context and the situation. You, you'd um, like to feel that you are a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you're you're the, the, the voice of common sense. What you'd like so to be, yeah. but sometimes, mm, that, right. sometimes in this world, that's mistaken as being on the other side. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying because people always. There are people out there who want you to decide. Remember when Bush said, uh, "You're for us or against us," or something like that. Mm -hmm. If you're not for us, against us. Huh? What do you say? Yeah, if you're not for us, you're against us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and I, I'm like, I don't know about that. Like. Because that paints with a pretty broad brush, and there may be circumstances where you where you have to make a decision, and where you have to stand. And okay, you know, uh, there was a skit on I think it was uh, 
was it Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel? I get it mixed up with it. No opinion guy. It was like last night or the night before. Yeah. No comment, no opinion. You know, and I, sometimes I feel like that guy, you know, and he, he said, uh, Fallon asked him, who are you going to vote for? And he said, I, I, I'm not sure, no opinion. And he said, but maybe Romney. And he's like, what? You know, well, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> he said, I'm just getting around to making a decision about that. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes that's how I am, too. Yeah, yeah. But and it, by the way, they, I read science says that the people who are undecided or no common opinion, they uh, something about I have to look it up again. But the study said these people are not they're the least biased among us because they they want to take time to hear everything rather than just make the decision and then have that stand. You well, know, that's I, why I, I don't think like I think that's anymore. the case with some of them, but not all of them. I think some of them are just stupid and lazy. OK, mm -hmm. uh, and and don't yeah. haven't made up an opinion because they haven't really been paying attention. You know, yeah, uh, then there are those people well, who have been paying attention and they still haven't really come up with an opinion yet. Although part of me goes, what kind of human being does it take to find uh, uh, Donald Trump anything other than objectionable? On, on whole, in total, yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, but but I can't I can't carry that mm -hmm. into every. I, I don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I, I don't carry it into every conversation because um, you know on uh, there, there's just certain areas. But it's the reason we've talked about this before. Why I don't listen to Sean Hannity because you know, and why I don't watch MSNBC. If they all, it's always the same. It's, it's like nobody can just raise a hand and say, "Well, wait a minute." Um, you know, they they did have the Abraham Accords during, you know, Trump's presidency. It was, it was a step in the right direction. It was trying something new. Like, no, 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 because it was Trump. And, and it's also when they had, the, I guess the Democrats had the border security bill. And Trump said to the Republicans, don't vote on that because I want it as an election issue. I totally, I, every Republican that, that agrees with that, I'm against you because that it's common sense to pass that. So you know what I mean. So each each bill, each uh, decision. If you take said you own. wanted a solution uh, to what was going on at the border, or or some kind of workable solution, that was the one they finally came up with. And all of a sudden, right. Trump says to his minions, and I don't know what the Republican Party feels Trump has on them. You right. know. He must have a diary somewhere where all the women they've ever cheated on he has in that book. You know, uh, kind of like Hoover it, it had something on everybody in the country who might be his enemy. Um, I just don't understand why they wouldn't vote for that. And they had agreed to vote for that. That's the point. And all of a sudden, Trump says, I don't want you voting for it. And it's, oh, you know, and they get down, they, they you know, just to well, give into his his way of thinking, and it's just amazing I to me. The, the Republican Party has always had sort of this rank and file voting tendency. You know, they they they're they're just motivated by certain principles, which have always been echoed on, you know, talk radio with you know with Limbaugh and Hannity and all those, and they just feel that there's, uh, you know, a strength in in always agreeing and having a. Up front. Yeah, but but you know, even even with a better more. part of common sense dictates that you shouldn't. Yeah. You know, that's what we're talking yeah. about here, and I think that's what bothers you know bothers especially somebody like uh, uh, Josh is just that kind of stupidity. You know, I wish we had a country in which the Republicans and Democrats felt their only job was to help the American public. <clears throat> and and that they would that's agree that, on things occasionally to get things done. Yeah. But that's, you know, in your dream world now, Josh, uh, not Josh, uh, 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 Bree, it, it's not going to happen. Would you agree, Josh? I don't think we're in any kind of an atmosphere where that's going to happen, where the American public is going to come first. Well, we're not, at this current moment, we're not really. I mean, I think that if they could push past Trump and Trump politics that they could get back to a area that is at least workable. 
mm-hmm. for example, they did agree on a border bill, right? Yeah. You know that if it had gone to the floor, would have gotten 300 votes in the House and 70 votes in the Senate, which is two thirds of, you know, I mean, it's it would have been fine. And the president would have signed it. It'd be a law today. And it didn't. Yeah. And it didn't because right. of one man and the attention and allegiance that people pay to that one man. But what did he have yeah. going for him? Well, you I, know, this I, is a guy who four years earlier had lost the Republican well, Party. There are people the that House. attract that sort of attention with. No, but there seems to be a fear. Done. Josh, there seems to be a fear. Well, I think part of it's fear and part of it is a sick allegiance to certain things. I, I mean, mean, you've got guys who, who Trump has has obliterated, uh, like yeah. uh, 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 what's his name down in Texas, a, Mar- a Cuban, uh, Cruz, rather. Cruz. Uh, yeah, Mark Cuban. Uh, t- t- Ted be, Cruz. Cruz and and he, he was Cruz's father of killing Kennedy, yeah. you know? And yet now who's sucking his dick? Cruz. Oh, I mean, they're look. They're men of love integrity. What? What? <laughs> You're getting demonetized for that. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. Oh, I mean, just... So people in the chat, Alex. People in the chat are asking. You should ask me directly who I'm voting. Uh, I, I don't think they I, they, I don't think they need to know, and I don't think you need to say. Okay. You know, if unless well, you want to, yeah. if you want to, it's fine. All right. That's what I would say. It's, but it's if you don't want to, hey, that's between you and your God. You know, uh, obviously, yeah. you just said you're not voting for Trump, well, so there's very little options. Right. <laughs> Is Jill Stein running this year? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> fill, fill in the blank. Well, you know, I mean, is is it, it, would you agree that's throwing a vote away? Me? Yeah. No, I, because everybody... Yeah, she is running. She's on the Green Party, so oh. Jill Stein. Oh, oh so you're voting for Jill Stein? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she's pretty good. Yeah, well, yeah, she has a really good shot this year. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a protest vote in a way. It's kind of like none of the above. Like, I don't really... Well, you know. what don't you like? <clears throat> Let me ask you this. Uh, what don't you like about, uh, about Kamala Harris? Well... I, I do like her, but several things. Um, one, she was not elected in, in the Democratic primary. She was one of the first to drop out, which indicated to me that, that she was she was not the choice of any anybody in the in the party except the elites. I, I heard. Well, also, 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 money. let's face it. It's a question of being able to get money and maybe she, the money ran out when her you know, her star wasn't rising any longer. You know, and so she had to, she had to come at the presidency from another direction. But my question is, I see, I felt when she when it turned out she was maybe going to be the nominee, I was I was going for Gavin Newsom. I figured he he could he could win, <clears throat> you know. Uh, but I was as soon as she got the you know got the go ahead from Joe Biden. And I started to listen to her. I went, this woman's better than I thought she was. You know, she's got more going for her. Uh, and, I, and I changed my mind. By the way, you can change your mind in spite of what the Republicans say. You are allowed yeah. to be for fracking one day and against fracking the next because somewhere along the line, you saw the light or something happened and you changed your mind. And I would much rather have a president that changes their mind and has that flexibility than doesn't. Well, that's and that's the key. I agree with you. And that's why I stopped watching and listening to Sean Hannity. We've, we've talked about this before. He used to have on Mike Farrell from, you know, the MASH uh, actor. Yeah. And they would debate issues like he was more open to hearing the other side and giving it a platform on his show. He'll never do. He can't do that now. He's in a straight chat. So it's like. I don't like that because, you know, he is he is essentially in a straitjacket. He has put. Well, he and I in got into a debate on the uh, on um, what's his name show. The guy was my friend who died. Uh, who was his partner one time? Bob uh, Grant. Uh, no, no. Uh, 
Yeah. Alan Combs. Alan Combs. Yeah. Oh, Alan Combs. Yeah, right. and I so I was on his sh- uh, Alan Combs show with him. We were, I think, a long time ago. We were discussing whether Schwarzenegger uh, would win the governorship in California. And um, after we had our discussion, in which I went after Hannity, and I said, "Come on, Sean, quit acting that way. You know, you're just uh, uh, to begin with. All this is is show business, and you you got to you can't take it that seriously." You know, and he's going. I'm not in show business. I'm a political commentator. Blah, blah, blah. And after it was over, I was told by uh, Combs that he had told him, "Don't ever put me on with him again." <laughs> yeah, well, we should get you a slot on the Hannity show now. Yeah, right. See, exactly. Well, I used to be on. Tuck- right, I used to be on Tucker Carlson's show every week. Oh, that you should. You could definitely do that again. When he was on MSNBC, <laughs> you know, I think it would be great to be on there. I would enjoy that. Well, you know, uh, go, you should be on with Pierce Morgan. Oh God! Oh God! <laughs> oh, there, you, see, we Alex, have so, you could hold your own. We have so many. You could ho- hold your own on that show, and they'd have you. Yeah, but but the trouble is, we have so many whores in this business. <clears throat> Uh, you know, yeah. all those guys are whores. You don't think Laura Ingram's a whore? Absolutely, she's a whore. And yeah, I don't yeah. mean that, that she's a prostitute. I mean she's a whore. She whores yeah. herself out. All of them do. All of them g- give in to that, you know, I'm going to be the right-wing nutcase because that's what plays over here at uh, Fox, and I'll make a lot of money out of it. Of course, a- Of course, anybody who's gone too far no longer has a job, you know, uh, what's his name? Lo- no longer had a job. Um, uh, O'Reilly. O'Reilly was out. What's his name? Um, um, uh, who am I talking about now? Was Tucker out. Carlson. Tucker Carlson was out. Yeah. Also, uh, what's his name? Uh, Beck. Beck was out. Any uh, of these guys who went far left trying to play the game so they could maybe make money off of Fox suddenly found themselves out of work because Fox never stood by them. You know, Fox didn't give a a crap. All Fox wanted to do was make money, and I'm telling you right now, Trump doesn't win this election, Hannity's going to be let go. So is what's-her-name, and most of those guys, because Fox is going to say, I guess this isn't where we've got to have our audience now. You know? What do you think, I tell Josh? You, I will vote for. What? Oh. Let's say that. Wait. I will vote for AOC in the future. AOC. She run. Good for yeah. you. Good for you. I like her a lot mm. myself. Yeah. See, see. So the one who well, said uh, he's voting for Trump, go screw yourself. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Josh, what what's some of your thinking on all of this? Well, I mean, Fox is. I think they do what they do, you know, basically as an arm of the Republican Party because it's a license for them to make money, you know. Mm-hmm. I think that MSNBC has taken up being an arm of the DNC because it allows them to make money, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, I think they have some people on there uh, le- that legitimately believe the stuff that they say, you know. I mean, but, you know... Nicole Wallace dedicates two hours a day to anti-Trump, anti-Trump, anti-Trump. And I don't know if it's for her. I think it's almost personal because I don't think she ever went to MSNBC to do that. I think it morphed into that after she got there and he came along because it was like, wow, he is ruining every single thing of the party that she helped build. You know, like I think it must be devastating for her personally because she helped get W. Bush elected and worked for him, and at the time, she, at her crowning achievement of the Republican Party, right after it, like, it all collapsed, you know? So, for some people, I think that it's personal. I mean, I certainly think, you know, Hannity and those guys, I mean, they have this shtick that they do, and, and it's obviously to make money, because I know they know that they they say things that they know are wrong, or that they know are... Uh, not correct, or they make yeah. huge deals about stuff that really are not big deals to anybody except the people watching their show. Let me bring up something here that is the argument within my household. 
okay? Mm -hmm. And the argument is about uh, P. Diddy or whatever his name is this week. Um, and, uh, the, you know, they've been denying him bail, mm -hmm. saying he's a flight risk. And I keep arguing to Marjorie that I don't think he's a flight risk at all because he's too well known. Yeah. You know, it's hard to be a flight risk if everybody knows what you look like. Yeah. And I saw Sean Combs uh, down here last week. Uh, they, that's where he is since he ran away or whatever. Yeah. My feeling is is that they're just doing, they're keeping him in jail because they want to look good. That it's not a well, practice, and that the bail should never be used as a punishment, ever. Well, the information that I got on that, and I really don't care about it, but, I mean, I couldn't help but hear it, was that they made a very strong case that as part of their indictment, he's been accused on many occasions, not just once, not just twice, on many occasions of witness tampering and witness intimidation, mm -hmm. sometimes through physical threats. And yeah. the way to stop the witness tampering and intimidation was to remove him from the public where he can make himself available to those witnesses. In other words, he now doesn't have a way to contact them and his communications inside lock up are monitored so if he tells someone to go intimidate that witness he's committed a crime well i mean and, wouldn't he be committing you know, a crime if he were get put out on bail and then when tried to intimidate those people yes but then they have no way of knowing i mean basically i mean he, he in the privacy of his own home yeah but, but he, he can give yeah. someone money to go intimidate a witness and they may never be able to prove that <laughs> Yeah. But in prison, he can't tell anyone anything. You have no expectation. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could care less about Sean or, Diddy or Combs. Jail. I could care less All about right. him. Yeah. He can rot in jail so far as I'm concerned. But I think the question of bail is that bail far too often is used as a punishment for a crime that has yet to be proven. Well, I think that's the case. And I would consider that the case in a lot of lower level stuff. I think this one, I, I don't see it that way, but I would agree with you in tons of other cases. I mean, I think there are plenty of other people that have unreasonable or high bail set well, or mean, no you, bail. You take some poor person you know. who gets, uh, you yeah. know, gets, uh, uh, you know, oh, I'm setting bail at a million dollars for you. Right. And, you know, they don't have that kind of money. I mean, yeah, to I begin mean, with yeah, the, I, the, I couldn't set a, I couldn't put up a. The a, bail should be commensurate with how much you make. You know, what do you, yeah. what do you think, uh, Brian? You haven't talked here for a while. We, we're talking mm -hmm. about T P Diddy, or uh, Sean Combs, or Puff Daddy, or whatever. <laughs> In the indictment, it reads Sean Combs. A.K.A. Yeah. Puff Daddy. A.K.A. And there were about like ten A.K.A.s. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 you know, flight risk. I think he would maybe take off. But look at look at OJ. Was OJ trying to take off too? <laughs> I don't know. Well, OJ um, o, OJ wouldn't stop for the cops. This is a guy, for instance, who was stuck around, and when it was time to turn himself in, turned himself in. Not exactly acting like a flight risk, you know. And I'm just saying that, you know, yeah, sure. He, he, you know, what he did is he, uh, he had his mother's house down in Florida. It was worth $50 million. And he paid off the final $17 million that he still owed on it so that the house could be put up for bail. Now, uh, $50 million is a lot of money in bail, even for Sean Combs, Okay. Isn't that showing your desire to, you know, to do what's right here? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm no fan of his, and I'm not standing up for him. And I think that everything he's been accused of, if true, proves what an absolute creep this guy is. Okay? But he hasn't been, he hasn't been found guilty of anything yet. Yeah, but that's, that's for times, right? What do you mean, desperate time? And, okay, so where is he going to go? If he, if, if he thinks he's going to prison for life, okay. So where is he going to go? Where is he going to go in the world that doesn't know who Sean Combs is? Yeah, but he could go to non-extradition countries like the UAE. He could go to Dubai mm -hmm. or I, Singapore. 
You know, I think I'd rather spend the rest of my life in prison than go to the UAE. Well, um, I, I know you lived there for a while, so I'm not. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, if I, he could go to, uh, yeah. But imagine uh, being stuck in Dubai. Okay, let's say you're stuck in Dubai for the rest of your life. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's not much more different than jail. I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, uh, it's a uh, lot prison, different. prison rape. I, don't, I heard prison rape is not fun. That's I never. Hey, listen, it, I Alex, got news for Alex, you. It's, be, you it's better. It's better than no sex at all. Okay, <laughs> Alex, have what? you been to Dubai? No, I've been Have to been Dubai. To... Yeah, but okay, I mean, let's go. you didn't want to spend the rest of your life there, okay? <laughs> but I could easily. No problem. And never leave there? Well, he could still go to Vietnam. He could go to Cuba, China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he's, got, he's maybe yeah. got to stop certain places before he gets there, and there he could be arrested. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, all I'm saying is, I mean, what are the chances he's going to flee? And if he does, he's a creep. We don't want him around here anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, but he could move to some place in the United States, and nobody sees him anymore. Oh, yeah, nobody's going to uh, nobody's. He's going to be go. He can go to, like, uh, where was it? Where's a far-flung place in the United States? Connecticut. He can go to Jeff's house and hang out. Whoa. Nobody would know him. <laughs> you know, he, he could go up to Let's say he could move in next door to you You don't think sure. your neighbors are going to At one point finally say Hey, that looks a lot like Sean Combs No <laughs> Some black guy next door <laughs> oh, yeah, Most, that, most that, people won't, will ignore him They won't even know who he is <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jeff's neighborhood is all white. I can picture it. I'm sure. Oh, no, I, I mean, yes. I've never been a big hip hop fan, but I know who Sean <laughs> Combs is. You know. Oh, I don't believe it. Jeff, could you pick out? Could you pick out Puff Daddy in the in the lineup? Me? I don't know. Jeff? No, no I don't know. Yes, yeah, see. I have no idea. What, what I'm more interested He's the only in, guy in the I'm, world that you wouldn't recognize if he didn't wear dark glasses. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I'm going to look uh, tomorrow about my brother-in-law, who's a real Republican nutcase forever. I, I got to ask him and say, are you still a Republican? Or are you still... Uh, supporting Trump. Hey, listen, I feel sorry. Well, I, I, we have one person who calls this program a lot, uh, Patrick Blazik, who is a Republican. He's a conservative. Uh, he, he's, he's not for Trump, you know. And I often tell him, right, Josh, that I feel sorry for him. Because, really, this guy Trump is ruining his party, you know, yeah. and ru ruining the beliefs he has. <clears throat> in what a party should be to its uh, constituency. Yeah, they're not really representing traditional conservative policy mm -hmm. values. I mean, you know, really what they're pushing and why it's appealable to people is because really what they push is nationalism. And nationalism has been popular over time in many different areas and has allowed... It, and, I, and the reason I don't believe that it is a good idea is because it has really never worked and it almost always leads to disaster, you mm -hmm. know? So for as much as I might not want as many people from here or there or whatever, I understand enough that sometimes you got to live with some of the bad things about your country to get all the good things in your country, because I don't think some of those things work. You know, historically, I haven't seen nationalism work. I haven't seen isolationism work. I haven't seen heavy tariff policies work you know, over long periods of times, but these things appeal to people emotionally, yeah. you know, so that's where a lot of his, well, I mean, it, of the base it, it, comes it, from. also, I mean, it takes a certain of na naiveness in politics. You see, most people in America don't know what they're voting for. They really mm -hmm. don't. And they don't do the kind of homework they should do to figure out who they're going to vote for. Okay. Well. They just believe what they hear. <laughs> 
you know? And in the case of, like, like for instance, the immigration problem, oh, we'll build a wall. That'll solve the problem. It will. You know? Well, they don't, they just don't have a super deep understanding of how these exact same things have played out before. You know, they don't understand that. That's another word for stupid, isn't it? Well, or ignorant, you know. I mean, they don't understand that if Americans had jumped into the fray in Europe in 1939 or 1940 instead of uh, later, that a lot less people would have died, including way less Americans, right? Mm -hmm. But isolationism, isolationism, isolationism. Oh, isolation. And then we were attacked. During World War II. I mean, II, so it well, just, you know. Well, we had come out of World War I, and we had a country in which the populace in general said, we don't want to go into another war. Mm-hmm, right. You know. So did Europe, right? But, you know, there were people that, despite it, understood that, you know, was coming anyway. <laughs> well, there are people that believe that, that well, Roosevelt actually allowed... Um, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor to happen. He knew it was going to happen, and he did nothing to stop it because uh, he needed an excuse to get into the war, both in the in, in the Pacific and in uh, Europe. I mean, that's a conspiracy theory, really. You know, that's there's not there's no historical basis or truth to that. Uh, you know, I well, mean, there's stories about the Japanese embassy vacating the day before Pearl Harbor, and we knew there was something that was going to happen. Well, there was a litany of warning signs that were missed by people, but I believe that, but I don't believe I know, but they were missed or they were misinterpreted. They were not known. Yeah. I mean, there was never any intelligence ever given to Roosevelt that said the Japanese are going to attack Pearl Harbor. And they're going to attack on this day. Can, can you imagine if that happened? We're going to, to let them. If that happened you know. today, there'd be no way we wouldn't know what was happening. Uh, well, that's possible. But, you know, the other thing is, really, uh, if the unless, Japanese... Unless, unless unless we put them in all the pagers. Yeah. If, the, if the Japanese had not messed up at Pearl Harbor, there would have been really no America getting into that side of the war very easily anyway. If they had really wiped out the Pacific Fleet like they set out to do... That would have been devastating. So he, that's why he could have never have let that happen. I mean, I mean, you know, it was just it would have been, it would have been devastating. I mean, it, you know, so there's no possible way that Roosevelt or anybody else would have ever let that happen. There are just too many smart and proud people that would never let Americans die for the sake of whatever you think their long-term value is. I said this last night, and I'll say it again. I mean, I'm, I certainly am not for Israel in the way they're handling themselves on the world stage, okay? Uh, but, man, that whole pager deal, that's purely James Bond stuff, isn't it? Fantastic. <laughs> I mean, technically super. Yeah, technically super and, and devastating because a lot of the people who got hurt were in Hamas, uh, not Hamas, but uh, Hezbollah, uh, they were kids, you know, and okay. and innocent men, women, and children. Uh, so you know, it, it, again, it's it's Israel not caring uh, who their bomb hits, you know, as long as it hits somebody. Yeah, the yeah. Bad part about that is now somebody else can learn how to do it. Oh, in absolutely, New York or wherever. Yeah, yeah. What were you going, going to say, exactly. Brian? Exactly. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, all these things, AI and everything that people are going to use for bad, and now you have something like this where they're using it for bad, you know, this technology, and now it's like, now it's out there, right? So. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, this is it for, you know, Hezbollah carrying pagers and walkie to- walkie-talkies they did the next day. Yeah. You yeah. know? Uh, and how they got them into the hands of these people is beyond me. And the fact that they didn't know, you know, obviously, pages are out of the question now. But yeah. then, then again, let that be a lesson to all of you who use pagers. Okay. <laughs> all the drug dealers. All the, the drug dealers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hey, listen, our theme is playing. And uh, this has been a del- really good hour of talk here with you and I. And, mm-hmm. Everybody, thank you, Brian, for being with us this evening. And uh, thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Josh, always good to see you here on the days when you don't work. 
Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, it's nice that we got everything cleared up with Bree, so that people can have an idea of who he's not for. Okay. Anyway, everybody, uh, give a big wave goodbye. I'll give you a big wave goodbye also, and say good night to all of you. You know, Amy Emanuel is next. She's here with the uh, with the show that comes up next, which is the intersection. You should stick with her and uh, enjoy her program and give her a call. I'll see you again tomorrow night. Same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, you know, tell her I love her, okay? Bye.